Hey guys, uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you for coming. And now it's um, Friday after evening almost. Um, my name is Manuel Copas. I am a lecturer in genomics. I've been doing genomics for about 20 years. Um, I've been teaching at Westminster for about two and a half years now. Um, I have been 12 years of my career at Cambridge, first in as a research in a research institute, then I went into industry. So I've been in both academia and um, industry. And today I I'm going to, we have two hours. Hopefully it won't go through those two hours. My objective for this presentation, for this class, is to give you an overview of how the human genome is actually helping us in the new era of, of, of personalized predictive medicine in the future and in, in the medicine of the future. So I'm just going to share this. So I'm going to share it. Um, We've done some slides with Dr. Wolfie from this, but I think we've only came until like cystic fibrosis, growth, no dwarfism. dwarfism. I'm, I'm sure there's going to be some overlap, but um, my, my experience is very, very different because I'm a, I'm a bioinformatician, so it's, I'm all about big data. So you can see that, right? Cool. Um, and I've really entitled my presentation on genetics. So I, I was told that I needed to talk about genetic diseases. So we're going to talk about genetic diseases, but then I had in the era of precision medicine. And when I say precision medicine, really what I'm talking here is big data. Okay. So um, what would I want you to get out of this lecture? So really to see how genomics, but I guess what understand what, what precision medicine is, and the um, but I want you to have as well as some kind of understanding of how ge the genome as, as a sort of source of information for how biological function is encoded can actually be an incredible uh, tool for understanding diseases and characterizing them. And then we're going to look at some applications, uh, real life applications of that. So we will be talking a little bit about uh, the human genome. We'll be talking about some very, very basic guidelines on, on how you can use the genome in the context of disease to, to diagnose and to help treat uh, um, diseases. We're also going to be talking about the difference between the type of illnesses that you're seeing with Dr. Bobby, which is mostly I would, I would call them monogenic. In other words, it's usually you have one gene, uh, the cystic fibrosis gene, and you know it gets truncated, and then you have a, a disease. But the, the the vast majority of disease that people uh, die in the West or they're affected, they are chronic diseases, you know, cardiovas cardiovascular diseases, um, neurological diseases, metabolic diseases. You know, people die of heart heart disease. They die of you know, stroke, the die of you know, complications of uh, type 2 diabetes, cancer. So these are the main diseases that people die of. And we'll see that actually they're incredibly uh, influenced by the genetic information that you have in your genome. So we're going to look at that as well. So the idea of using the human genome and, and why we call it 
personalized or precision medicine is because we all know that um, they're all different. And in fact, whenever we have one particular disease, we are showing a manifestation of that disease as a manifestation that is influenced by our, by our genetic code and by environment as well. But, but we have these two environment and genetic code that have an influence in the way we suffer disease. And so the idea of using uh, genome data into diagnostics and treatment is to help patients have the right drug, uh, diagnose the, in the right way, at the right time, with the right dose, uh, diagnose, diagnose at the point of care in, in a way that um, they call it P4 medicine, uh, you know, which is participatory, preventative, personalized, and predictive. So there's some, there's a, um, I would say, uh, full mouth, you know, participatory, and so on. So this is this is this is the, I would say, the the vision, and, and let's see how how close we get to that vision as of today. So. Um, I'm sure you all know what a genome is, which is a complete organism's uh, set of DNA. And genomics is different from genetics. So genetics is focused on a gene. That's why we call it genetics. Whereas genomics is when we look at all of the genes, all of the genetic data that we have in the trillion cells of our body. Right. So what we try to do in genomics is that uh, we're able to understand how the interrelations of all of the organism's genes actually influence function and hence disease. So we understand disease as some kind of dysfunction uh, which is influenced or it's a consequence of some genetic predisposition that is going to make you um, suffer from that disease with greater or less probability. So you've seen this before. We have the human genome here. So it's, you know, when you look at under the microscope, so you see the chromosomes, although this is not the whole human genome because here I'm not showing the mitochondrial genome. So that's also part of the human genome. But we are looking at the um, DNA, uh, the part of the genome that is within the nucleus of the cell and is composed of 20, 22 autosomes which are the, the chromosomes that are non-sexual, and then one, one, par, one, one pair of um, sex chromosomes. And so um, within each of those chromosomes, actually we now have some consensus reference that allow us to be able to tell specifically where each of the genes are located within each chromosome. And we see that genes um, there are complex segments uh, scattered throughout the whole of the length of the chromosomes where, you know, some bits are encoding for proteins, we call them exons, some others are uh, not coding uh, within genes, we call them introns. So we have intergenic regions and then intragenic regions and those intragenic regions have coding bits called exons and then non-coding bits called introns. So the Human Genome Project, which started in the late 90s, had as, it, as, it, as its goal to understand really all of the different, have a map of all the, of all the DNA that composes each chromosome. And so by having a map, then we can have specific locations of where genes are, and that's going to help us understand the whole process of inheritance. A mapping the human genome then therefore involves the sequencing of a huge amount of, of data that we have within our cells and then assembling it, all those data that we get into some kind of mosaic that give us, gives us a consensus sequence. And that consensus sequence is not representative of one individual, it's, it's a consensus uh, set of DNA letters that 
we, we now have coordinates assigned to them. And as a map, you, 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 you know, you can also have something similar to a Google map uh, or a genome, human genome browser. Here I'm showing one of them, it's called Ensemble. You can zoom in, you can zoom out. Uh, and the great thing about this is that it helped, helped us really see at the very minute detail each of the different features that, that the genome has and also allow us to be able to add information. You know, in the same way when you have Google Maps, you know, you can see, for example, on top of the map, specific traffic um, routes, or you can see labels uh, about, I don't know, let's say, you know, height or information on top of that. So that's why it's so important to have a, a, a human genome map, because that way, we know how to go from A to B. We, we can really navigate the, the, the complexity of the information that exists. So the, the, human, the first human genome um, costs around $1.5 billion. And it took 15 years, 13 years to come out. Um, but the, the, the time and the price for um, generating a, a human genome has exponentially decreased, especially around 2007, 2008. Here you, you can see this is actually a logarithmic um, graph. And here we have Moore's law. Have you heard of Moore's law? So uh, Gordon, Gordon Moore was the CEO of Intel. You've heard of Intel, right? Which is the, one of the biggest chips, uh, chip makers in, in the world. And he said that the power of computing duplicates every 18 months. So every 18, if, if we compared the proportion at which computing power uh, has been happening, which Moore's law has been actually being a good predictor of, of, of how much computing power we get with time. So we see that the rate at which we've been able to produce human genome has been much faster than the exponentially um, represented here Moore's law capacity for computing. So in other words, we've been able to generate much more data than, than computers have been able to uh, advance in a way. And so um, this means that genomics has become really one of those, um, I would say, scientific fields that have pushed uh, the, the computation uh, and because of the amount of, of, of data that, that we are now able to produce as a co at a cost that is reasonably affordable, but you can see how it is that um, after the 2010s, that that decrease has not has not gone through the same sort of uh, jump. So it's, we've we've been for a while now that the the, the price for a whole genome oscillates around one thousand dollars. So this is actually a real real data that I get uh, is actually I saw screenshots of my own genome and um, so, so this is a real sequence of, of, of a genome and this, this is the way it looks, right? So you have um, uh, whining, cytosine, uh, thymine, whining, 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 adenine, thymine, thymine and, and you get this long string of letters that gives you the sequence, the specific sequence that, that that particular person has. We know, or we, we actually believe that this is probably the most unique identifiers that, that exist for any given person, even more than your fingerprint. So this is more unique than your fingerprint. And, but it's quite challenging because, you know, they call it the book of life, but actually is the, the analogy of being a book kind of 
you know, breaks apart quite quite soon because you know there are no spaces, there are no there are only chapters that are, you could call that you know are the chromosomes, are chromosomes that they can be very long, 150 million letters. Um, so I I think what I find fascinating is that you know how how does the organism the machinery is able to find the, the where the genes are. I mean, a gene is, is, is a segment of, of, of this bit, but you know, it's able to find it, um, it's able to start transcription, um, and so on. So, so this is incredible that the machinery is able to, the, the molecular machinery of the cell is able to, to, to find genes, for instance. And at the beginning of the release of the human genome, there were algorithms that try to predict what bits would be genes, what bits would, wouldn't be genes. We know, for example, that um, genic regions are more GC, um, GC rich, if I get it correctly. I need to look at that. But anyway, um, we, but, but still it's very challenging. And we've been able to find where the genes are. We've been able to find what the promoter regions are, you know, regulatory regions within within the within the genome. And, and we now have a obviously much more complete understanding of, of what the genome does. However, we're still very, very far away in our in our journey to be able to understand really how that code produces, you know, this organism, you know, and, and, and I always, always get fascinated about, you know, thinking that the, the fertilized egg, you know, already had all of the information, you know, you look like your dad or your mom, you look, uh, you know, you have all of these things that you've inherited, all that development information that you uh, contain, and it's all in that, in that information there somehow, we're still trying to decode it, and there's a lot to, to, to be done, and there's also quite a lot of biases, because we, we tend to, to, to do research on what we already know, and so there are many things that we don't know that don't get so much attention. But anyway, um, some people, you know, get, uh, there's been a lot of frustration because when, when the Human Genome Project came out in 2001, um, people, you know, you, you had the President of the United States, Anthony Blair, you know, uh, talking with the scientists, you know, this is going to re revolutionize medicine and so on. And it's taking a lot of time for this vision of personalized, predictive, participatory, uh, preventative medicine to, to become a reality. So, um, and it's taking such a long time. I mean, I'm not sure if you've heard of somebody called Craig, Craig Venter. Actually, Dr. Bobby mentioned him in the last presentation mm -hmm. that he was an um, American businessman and a scientist. Uh, he did his money during the startup encoding the human genome. Yes. So he was. Uh, he he. I I saw him two weeks ago. Last week, actually. Yeah, I was there. So, so basically, he said that the reason why we still haven't managed to make as much progress as we anticipated is because we've been focusing on the sequencing and really um, you you can't really know what the sequence does, the sequence does if you don't know the phenotype in other words if you don't understand um, or are able to correlate the the, the resulting traits, phenotypes um, that come from, 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 the, from the sequence. So that correlation, genotype, phenotype, um, still remains to be further developed. So some facts about the human genome. Um, so we have here all of the chromosomes. On, in, in red, you can see the number of, of total genes that each of the chromosomes have. So chromosome one has around 4,400 4, genes. Then on the right-hand side, the total 
number of letters, we call them, we call them base pairs. So chromosome one has approximately 250 million base pairs. The smallest one, which is chromosome 21, um, is around 50 million. So this is a huge amount of, of if you think about putting all, all those 3.3 billion letters into one uh, segment or into one sequence, it would be something like 7,000 miles long. So you could you could um, cross the Atlantic with this. Uh, so, so so long, right? And so there's no way that a human mind can really grasp and analyze um, this kind of information. But you know we are we are on luck here because um, your computers are really good at, at, at analyzing strings, and and you know the human genome is a string at the end of the day. So so for processing strings. Um, and, and the marrying between the genomics and the computation is what has really catapulted this this field into really um, some pervasive um, technology across all of the medical uh, specialties. You know, from from neurology, from pediatrics, from you know uh, oncology. Um, uh, there are very, very few, if any, uh, medical specialty that now doesn't care about your genetics. Because, as I said, uh, genetics is, to some extent, uh, a big influence in your disease development or health. So, I've mentioned this, that having a human genome map is important because we can use it as a reference and it can help us understand diseases. As a reference because, as I said, you know, if you have a map, then you can go from A to B. If you don't have a map, you're completely lost. You don't know what, you know, what the functions are. You don't have any possibility to be able to um, understand the, the physiology at the molecular level. And it helps us understand diseases because we know that there's always a genetic component that affects diseases. I mean, I've been in a situation where some some extreme example, you know, uh, you, you somebody throws you a stone and it hits your head. Is that genetically um, conditioned? That people would say no, but maybe. Of course, he can have a genetic condition. Yeah, you, yeah, maybe that person is more aggressive, that person is, you know, autistic or there's something. But yeah, obviously that's kind of a theoretical, stupid example to some extent. But, you know, all the main diseases that people die of, right, um, that I mentioned earlier, they have a strong genetic component, okay? And and we, we see that, you know, you see that um, if, if you have a, a relative that has Alzheimer's, you have a lot more chances of having Alzheimer's. If you have a relative that has mm, breast cancer, you have a lot more chances to develop breast cancer. We'll talk about this in a, in, in a few minutes. So the human genome, I said that is completely unique for, for each individual, and it can help us understand diseases through the presence of mutations that have a likely deleterious effect, or the identification of mutations that are linked, for instance, to forms of cancer, or even your ability to metabolize uh, drugs. And, you know, depending on the specific sequence that you have in the uh, set of genes called um, cytochromes, so there's a, there's, a, there's a gene called CYP2D6, so 25% of all drugs prescribed as of today are metabolized by that gene. And depending on the sequence that you have for that gene, you may be a poor metabolizer, you may be an intermediate metabolizer, uh, an ultra rapid metabolizer. If you are an ultra rapid metabolizer and you, give, you are given normal dose, you are going to have a potential toxicity. For instance, coding, coding, which is a strong analgesic, um, it gets 
uh, metabolized into morphine. So if if you have have an overdose of, of morphine, then you can even have a um, respiratory uh, rest. So I mean, this is this is serious stuff, and this is actually affecting in some populations, like for for instance, Oceanians. Seventeen percent of Oceanians uh, are ultra rapid metabolizers, and there are other other drugs. For instance, warfarin, which is the most prescribed anticoagulant. And we know that the dosing algorithms, uh, the, the prescription of, of warfarin, again, is uh, conditioned by your gen genetics. And depending on, on what genetics you have, it's better for you to have a higher or a lower dose. And we know, for instance, that one in every four Africans um, get adverse drug reactions against uh, warfarin because the, they have their own own specific that is uh, genetic makeup and so you know again this is a very clear example of how genetics is as of today influencing how healthcare is given or received so genetic variation there are different types of genetic variation. So I've mentioned, I, I, I like to call this the sort of digital, digital um, biology, if you wish, where um, the information that we have for our sequence is now, as we see, digital. And we see that there are, you know, there are different types of changes that you may have. And so genetic variation are those changes that we look at when we analyze somebody's genome. And, and genetic variation is some change in your sequence that you have against the reference human genome. I'm going to repeat that because this is very important for, for genomics. A variant or a genetic variation is the, a difference that we find between your genome and the reference human genome, the map that we said you know, it, that took 15 years to, to, to come out. Um, and so that's the bit that we usually look at. That, that's the bit that we analyze, the, the genetic variants. And the most common, yeah? So I have a question. You know the standard uh, human genome uh, that was included in the Nobel Prize for Medicine? Yes. Is that the same thing? Yes. 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 Yes probably have like some kind of mutation. Does it mean that one is like perfect? Like doesn't have any No, it's, it's just simply an imperfect consensus that we use as a reference. So um, we need it because whenever we get data from a human person, we can't sequence the whole thing at once. It's so long. So we kind of have to cut their genetic um, material, their DNA in millions of, 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 bit of, of fragments, then those fragments, you align them against the, the human genome, and, and we look at the differences. So if you have a difference, however, with the reference genome, pretty likely that it's going to be uh, something, um, yeah, it's going, to be, it's going to be a variant. But uh, it, it, help us, it helps us um, have a catalog because, uh, as I said, what we look at is, is those bits that are different from the reference. So even if um, those people that were used for the reference genome wouldn't have any variant, we still are able to sort of assign information to the specific locations. Mm -hmm. Not sure if I'm able to answer your question correctly, but anyway. So here is an example of a SNP or a SNP, which is a single nucleotide polymorphism. And, and that a SNP is a change of one letter. So if you have a T in that position, then it becomes an A, or you may have a C and it becomes a G. So that's, that's a SNP. So there are around four to five million SNPs in a person's genome. But that varies because, for instance, we know that um, African populations are more diverse. And 
I have found that they tend to have around 7 million. Um, in fact, there's more diversity in the, in, 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 in the genomes of Africa than the rest of the world combined. And, and this is because humans appear in Africa and there, there's been a lot more time for humans in Africa to, um, to evolve. Whereas yeah, uh, uh, humans started around, Homo sapiens started around 350,000 years ago. And then the first humans that left Africa uh, were, was around 80,000 80, years ago. So there's been a huge amount of time uh, in Africa before uh, Homo sapiens left the continent. So uh, strictly speaking, we are all Africans because we all come from there. Um, so using SNPs, we can track the inheritance of disease and we can use them to understand complex diseases. So here is, a, is one SNP. Uh, so there's a database called DBSNP. So DBSNP is one of the NCBI, I'm sure you've, you've heard of PubMed. Uh, so within the NCBI, you have uh, DBSNP, which is the database of SNPs. And it has the complete catalog of all existence all, all SNPs that we know of. Last time I looked at it, there were, uh, I think it was last year, um, there were around 150 million SNPs. So, I mean, but obviously, if the whole genome is around 3.3 billion, so there's still a huge amount that we don't know of. Anyway, so, this particular gene, uh, this particular SNP is located in position, and this is because we have the human genome, position chromosome 19, and then position 44,908,684. So in that specific position, um, the reference, so the human genome reference is a T, and then if you change that T into a C, then you have that particular SNP, which actually, as you can see here, is part of a gene called APOE, which you might have heard of. And that particular SNP uh, causes, is, 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 is a missense mis -sense variant. Do you know what a missense variant is? So, um, a missense variant actually change, changes the amino acid, changes one amino acid in the protein sequence. So in other words, that little change is going to have an effect in the sequence of amino acids that result from, from, that, from that gene. And so as you can see, whenever you find uh, variants, and we said that there, there are some, somewhere between five to around five million variants. SNPs, you need to really understand where they are located, what genes are they affected, if any, and then what p potential effect they might have. That's, that's really um, the, the, the kit of, of what we are trying, you know, the, 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 the important bit is the interpretation. So you may have all that information, but unless you are able to match that information because we have the, the, the we know the change and we also know the location that allow us to then be able to see in reference databases like DBSNP how much we know about that that particular variant and that's going to help us understand you know whether this particular variant has an effect in in the in the patient and you know, the other question would be whether an individual who inherits this particular variant uh, has the same condition as the same person that had that particular variant. So there's something called the American College for Medical Genetics that has set a, number, a standard for interpretation of, of genetic variants. So a variant can be pathogenic. It, 
if it contributes directly to the development of disease, although some pathogenic uh, changes may not produce disease 100% every time that somebody carries them. That's what we call um, penetrance. So, so one particular variant may be fully penetrant if 100% of the cases, when you have that variant, the patient has a, a particular pathogenic, pathogenic phenotype. Can you think why uh, not all pathogenic variants are fully penetrant? For instance, yeah. it could be environment, it could also be um, genetic interactions. So that, that mutation might be compensated by another mutation elsewhere, so somewhere else, that, in another gene yeah. or in the same gene that, you know, potentially that modulates that change into something that doesn't cause uh, disease. So another um, ca category that you can have is likely pathogenic. When we cannot fully rule out the possibility that new evidence may demonstrate that this sequence has uh, little or no clinical significance, but we are, we are pretty sure that most likely has. And then we also have variants of uncertain significance. So the vast majority of the 150 million variants that I mentioned there are variants of uncertain significance. And this is a huge problem because um, we really don't know whether they have an effect or not. And it's simply because for us, in order to be able to, to, to see if it has an effect, we will have to conduct a, for instance, clinical trial or an experiment with cases, with controls. Uh, it requires a, a lab, uh, uh, equipment and so on, and when you have, you know, hundreds of millions of variants, you know, hundreds of millions of experiments, it's impossible. So there's a huge push towards um, usage of artificial intelligence to be able to predict um, the likely effects of, of variants using contextual information. There are also Variants that are likely benign or, or, or benign. We don't usually look at those. So how do we get this variant whenever we analyze a patient? Well, we can, we can have, these are the, the most used type of technologies for, for generation of variants. So you can have, they, they cost differently, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mostly, I, I think I've ordered here from, from least expensive to most expensive. The problem is that um, as you get, uh, if it's less expensive, then you're going to have much less, much, much less or less, um, I, I would say, flexible amount of information. Uh, but if you get more expensive, like exome sequencing, which means you, you get the sequence of all coding, coding regions in a genome. That's what we call an exome. Um, you get a lot of data, you know, for, for a whole genome in a person, you may get like four gigabytes of data. Uh, all of that data related to protein coding regions, which are around 2% of the genome, but they cause around 80, 85% of all disease causes mutation. So, Sometimes this is a good compromise, but a lot of the time that's not good enough because a lot of the uh, mutations that affect our genome and our health, they are outside of coding regions. They might be, for instance, in regulatory uh, regions, then promoter regions, they might be in introns, they might be somewhere else. So uh, the, the best possible type of um, genetic analysis or tests that you can perform is the whole genome. But of course, you know, it costs, as I said, around $1,000 and not everyone can afford that. In fact, very few people in the world or, or health systems can afford that. And it's not just the generation of the data because 
uh, then you have to interpret that data. And, and that's where the real challenge is, because you may end up having huge, you know, files, uh, a lot of it uh, of uncertain significance, as I said, and unless you are lucky that you get a patient that happens to have a variant that has been identified before, you are not going to be able to get a lot of uh, results on, on, on genome sequencing. Uh, but that said, once you do your, your whole genome, because your genome never changes, um, you, you have the same genome you were born with, so you can you can reanalyze, reinterpret with time, and that can be really useful. Uh, once you do your whole genome, then you don't have to do it again. So this is a hypothetical representation of how uh, whole genome uh, works. I said that um, the way we usually get the genetic data is by um, cutting the, the genome of the, the DNA of a person into millions of fragments. So you probably have heard of these, these technologies called Illumina, right? So Illumina is a, a company that provides instruments. Those instruments allow you to uh, sequence the genome. The way it works is that, as I said, it, it cuts your DNA into millions of fragments, then you amplify those fragments then you adapt those fragments to run through what they call a lane, and then you end up with millions of fragments, like a massive uh, puzzle that you need to um, recompose using the, the reference genome DNA. So, it's, so there's a huge amount of computing power that is required to, to get those fragments. So here you see the, the, the Illumina short read fragments that we see here. And they are aligned because you have, you know, the sequence of the reference. So if you have that fragment that, are, that all of the bases are identical to the one in the, in the reference, then you are um, sure that that fragment belongs to that particular position. Sometimes you may get fragments that have one particular uh, variant here. So you see all of these fragments. They're aligned in the same position, but th there is one particular change here highlighted in blue. Uh, how do you tell that that change is not an artifact? Well, by having redundant amount of sequencing aligned on the same position, the likelihood for that variant, for that change to be uh, an artifact is very low if you have, you know, all of these different fragments that have aligned at that position and specifically they have that particular variant. So this is really how you find the variants in, in next generation sequencing through the alignment of the fragments against a reference genome and then looking and identifying uh, bits of that genome that are the higher variants and, and you have those different fragments all aligned uh, coinciding with the same with the same variant. There's obvi obviously there's always some kind of mathematical probabilistic method that you know will will give you uh, this particular for this particular SNP the likelihood that this SNP is a false positive is x. You know, and based on that uh, likelihood, you can confidently assign to that specific position whether you have a SNP or not. Any questions? Have I really um, confused you with my? No. It's fine. The more, like, it's very confusing, but I feel like it's going to get to your head. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything I can uh, explain again that makes it less confusing? Maybe if you could just slightly repeat the Illumina sequencing, the amplifying process, the amplifying process. Yeah. So Illumina sequencing is the use of an instrument that basically the, the, the thing that it does, the, the whole point of, of Illumina sequencing is that, uh, you know, Sanger, the way it works, 
So Sanger, you have a fragment, let's say 100 or 300 um, nucleotides. And then you can tell specifically what the sequence is. So Illumina sequencing, what it does, is able to sequence at the same time billions of fragments. These billions of fragments, they are going to be random fragments that comes from breaking your, from, from, from pre preparing the DNA into, we call them libraries. So you have um, the, your starting DNA and then you, you basically have a way of cutting it in around 100 to 300 fragments long and you have those, um, the whole genome from many different cells cut randomly with fragments of around 100 to 300 uh, nucleotides long. So you, you then prepare those fragments, millions of fragments, which are randomly cut across the whole length of the human genome. And so you then use computers to align the sequence that you have of those, fra those fragments that you've, that the uh, instrument has, has sequenced. The instrument doesn't know where those fragments are. The only thing it does is tells you what, the, what sequence you have for all of those fragments that you fed, in, in, fed them into the instrument. And so then you have to use computers to rebuild or assemble, we call it assemble, the, the actual DNA sequence of the, of the patient. And so by comparing, first by, by aligning the this, this sequences of those fragments against the reference genome, you, we, we can then build like a scaffold here of many different fragments. They're all, there's a lot of redundancy. We want a lot of redundancy, meaning the same base pair, the same position covered by many different fragments so that if you find a variant, a, a bit that is different, then you can have high confidence that that, that that bit that changes is actually real. Here you have some other changes, but you know, you don't have consistency uh, between the different random fragments. So that's why we, we know here that there are no, no variants. But there are, uh, when you find that there are many different randomly uh, generated fragments that overlap and they all have the same change at the same position in the reference genome, then you can infer that there's probably a variant there. This is slightly clearer. Shall I repeat again? No, it's fine. Are you getting bored? No. Okay, so next generation sequencing, I mean, Illumina being the sort of best known, what it does is to use massively parallel sequencing platform to know the exact positions of nucleotides in a DNA sample. And so you have millions of DNA fragments that are sequenced at the same time. And, and so um, it's able to produce somewhere between 10 to 600 gigabases, so millions of, of nucleotide bases per hour. So, um, and, and the fragments, which we call them reads, can be up to 700 nucleotide uh, bases long. And may I ask what parallel? Parallel. Um, In that context. Ah, yes, at, at the same time. Oh, at the same time, okay. Yeah, okay. in parallel. So, uh, as I mentioned, you can do two types of sequencing, mainly exon, which means you just sequence the bits that are coding, or genome, where you basically do the sequencing for the whole genome. Uh, so, exon sequencing is around 50% the price of a whole genome. And you get the two, two giga, gigabytes of data of coding regions, which are, you know, very important, especially for monogenic diseases. Whereas for the whole genome, you basically cover the whole length of all, of all chromosomes, with some exceptions I'm not going to go into. So currently, if you do an exome, the chances for you to be able to find a, diagno a diagnosis for somebody who's got a rare genetic disease 
uh, it's around 30 percent if you have a whole genome then it may get I think it's probably less than 70 percent more like 50 percent actually um, so as you can see in general around 50 percent at least of all patients that have genome sequencing don't get diagnosed in unequivocally and you may think that this is not so good but before the genome revolution our ability to diagnose just by looking under the microscope was around 10 percent so when you when you think about what's happened in the last 20 years our diagnostic rate for genetic diseases have jumped from 10 percent diagnostic rate to around with the appropriate resources around 50 percent so this is a qualitative massive jump actually so i'm sure you you all have you are familiar with with this um set of phenotype can you guess what kind of down syndrome. down syndrome and it's a consequence of what <laughs> something extra one chromosome. yes uh, you have an extra copy of chromosome 21 okay and this is one of the most common genetic diseases that exist because actually is relatively mild you had a question no, because you just said, like, what are the most genetic diseases? So I was about to say. You're like, oh, you said, what are the most. Yeah. So I was about to say, but then I kind of stopped. <laughs> was Has it been Down syndrome? Has it been like 1,000 years? Or is it recent? Uh, I've never been asked that question. Because um, <laughs> like, I was speaking to my teacher, and my teacher was saying, something like that, it's telling me like it's recent. And I was like, oh, I probably disagree. I think it's, um, we've had Down syndrome for, well, my, I'm, ha I'm hypothesizing here, so I would disagree. Because okay. um, it's Down syndrome is dependent on mostly how meiosis happens in the cell. So if you get, like, when you have the separation of chromosomes, uh, and the generation of the gametes and there is you know the a mistake can happen and and then that that chromosome extra chromosome doesn't get split in the right way and then it passes on uh, in, into the you know if, 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 if that egg or sperm is the one that gets fertilized that, that becomes a zygote then it gets passed on. The thing is, why do we only see chromosome 21? Why don't we not see chromosome 1, trisomy, or loss? It's just that the other, they, they still exist. And, and this is most likely why you have like um, uh, spontaneous, like, you know, um, pregnancies that don't, don't reach uh, full term. Uh, most, it's quite common. Uh, and it's mostly because of the other type of potential we call it aneuploidies so uh, changes in the number of chromosomes uh, or chromosome number abnormalities that the, this the most common type of uh, lost pregnancies that we have but because as i said earlier chromosome 21 is the smallest chromosome it has the uh, probably the smallest number of genes and so having that extra number of genes which are going to mean you're going to have probably more expression of those functions for those genes that's you know you just still can live with them but the vast majority of the different aneuploidies that exist the changes in the chromosome number it is completely unviable un 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 you cannot live with that okay. so like your assumption is that it within like my assumption is that it's existed before uh, uh, we. That has been like recorded. Though, ah, recorded is right now. I mean, yeah. it was discovered by Jerome Lejeune in in the um, must have been around the 50s. 
outside. No, no, I, I know. I, I, well, so my, not for that exact. I, I, I know exactly because I mean, my son has Down syndrome, so I really understand this disease quite well. Okay. Um, so uh, the discovery, I cannot tell you the exact date. I know it was uh, Jérôme Lejeune in France, and he um, he was the person that discovered that Down syndrome is a trisomy, we call it trisomy of chromosome 21. So an extra, um, we didn't know about that. It must have been, I'm, I'm just guessing around the, around the 50s. But as a disease, it has existed, uh, I, I'm sure gorillas, you know, are, 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 you know, our evolutionary ancestors or species, they, they they have it. Obviously, it will express differently, but I mean, this is, I don't think this is just a human type of disease. Obviously, now, now that you, I'm thinking about it, you know, gorillas have different number of, of, of chromosomes, right? So I guess that, okay, so Down syndrome is only going to be in those species that have the same number of chromosomes as uh, homo sapiens have, you know, a homo erectus, I guess that homo erectus will have had, you know, the Neanderthals will have had Down syndrome, I would expect. Um, but I think I need to do some research on that. I, I would be interested to see, now that you've put that question in my mind. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'll try, yeah, I'll put it on social media for sure. So, but you can see basically that there's a direct effect on your genetics and what you see at the level of the organism. So your the the hardware, the way you look, the way your your you function is absolutely conditioned by by that genetic information that you have in your in your in your chromosomes. You've seen uh, the Mendel's laws, right? We, those that, um, that took uh, molecular biology, I think you, you did take molecular biology and you, uh, so then you, you know what Mendel's laws are? <laughs> yeah, so we have like, you know, the, the, the law of, of, of independent assortment, yeah, the, like the, the law of dominance, you know, so um, that applies very well when you're just looking at one gene. So the, the genius of Gregor Mendel was that he was able to identify a species, peas, that can reproduce very easily and you can cross them very easily and then be able to analyze traits that are monogenic. So there's one gene that causes whether peas are green or or yellow. There are some one other gene that uh, produces white flower or pu purple flower. Um, and those laws of dominance and recessive. Um, by the way, we are diploid, meaning that we have two copies of the same chromosome. One copy comes from the mother, one copy comes from the, from the father, and, and the, the, there are some, some mutations or some variants that for them to be able to be expressed, you have to have the, the, the same variant or the same gene or the same version of the gene uh, in both copies. So that's what we call recessive. If one copy of one particular gene version is enough for that trait to be expressed, then we call it dominant, okay? But as I said, it works fine when you're just looking at one gene, but when you're looking at most of the diseases that people die of in the West or everywhere else, like cancer, like diabetes, these are polygenic diseases. So you have many, many genes that contribute in very small um, quantities to the susceptibility of that disease. 
So here you have the, the table that basically compares what we call Mendelian diseases. So diseases like cystic fibrosis, for instance, or another uh, very well known is, um, sorry? Cycle disease. Cycle anemia, yeah. Uh, the, another one would be uh, Huntington's disease, right? So it's, you, you have one gene affected, that's enough. Right, so those type of diseases, they tend to be rare, so that they affect very few people. Obviously, when you put all of the rare diseases together, it's around 6% of the global population, so it's not so rare. Um, but, as I said, um, there are five diseases, coronary artery disease, age of fibrillation, type 2 diabetes, breast cancer, and inflammatory bowel disease. Those five diseases affect 20% of all deaths in the West. Really? Yeah, so 20% so of all deaths has any, any combination of those in the West. So, and those diseases which have a, you know, like any other disease has a strong genetic component, which is highly heritable. IBS is genetic? Is IBS. Inflammatory bowel disease. And that's genetic. Well, genetic and environment, but actually uh, we'll see that in a moment. Uh, there are some diseases that are more uh, genetically, genetically uh, more, more a consequence of, of, of your genetics are, are diseases that not so much, but still you have to have, you know, your genetics will play a role. So I, I usually call it like contribution to, to disease. So for some diseases, like for instance, um, in general, I would say all mental or psychological diseases are around 50% uh, caused by genetics and 50% by the environment. I'm thinking of things like depression, uh, PTSD, um, autism. Actually, autism is more than is very highly highly heritable. Um, I mean, we, we see those diseases, right? They go in the family. Um, schizophrenia, highly heritable. Um, but but they are the consequence of not one gene. It's a consequence of thousands of genes. You know, millions of variants. Type 2 diabetes, uh, our current models for prediction of risk have around 7 million SNPs. Right? So you could, you could imagine 7, 7 million SNPs, all of them uh, contributing tiny, tiny uh, proportions of, of genetics. But when you put them all together, that, that sort of cloud of, of, of genetic contributions put you in the high risk spectrum or in the low risk spectrum. So the, the Mendel Mendelian diseases, they tend to have, uh, you know, if you have that mutation for um, Huntington's disease, regardless of the environment, you're going to have it. You know, when, when the time comes, you're going to have it, no matter what. Um, same for cystic fibrosis, same for um, Mendelian diseases. However, complex diseases such as, you know, inflammatory bowel disease or type 2 diabetes, you know, the, there's a lot more influence of the environment. So, if you know that you have a high predisposition for type 2 diabetes, you can do something with your diet to avoid it, or at least to reduce the risk for you to have it, right? So, so for complex diseases, which are polygenic, that is, you have many genes influencing their uh, susceptibility, you have, you have uh, strong environment factors that, that will affect whether you develop it or not. So here we have um, two sort of extreme uh, examples. So type 2 diabetes is mostly it's a complex disease with many genes, but it's mostly genetic. So in other words, um, and, and you find it that you know, uh, type 2 diabetes tend to be children, whereas um, type 2 diabetes tend to be older people. So, so 
not so much i mean still quite quite influenced by 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 your genetics but you know you can do more in your environment here we have another extreme like for instance melanoma which is a type of skin of uh, skin cancer so if you have a high predisposition genetic predisposition and you never have you know you have exposed yourself to the sun then you 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 won't have it right but if you go to the beach uh every summer like it happened to my aunt um uh, she died of melanoma I, I analyzed i analyzed her genome like five five gene five years after she passed away and then i found that she had mutations for for skin cancer so so the thing is if you take care of your you know, for some diseases um, the genetic contribution is a lot smaller and then the, envir the environment conditions are going to have a much greater effect in your um, likelihood of developing it so for those complex diseases the way to really identify what variants are actually increasing the susceptibility is through something called genome-wide association studies have you heard of genome-wide association studies so this is a very important tool in, in genomic medicine the way it works is th something like this so you have cases let's say for instance that you have uh, people with melanoma right and then you have controls people that don't have melanoma right there there are some sort of statistical um, quality control things that you have to do they, so for instance that they all belong to the same uh, ancestry background that they you know you try to minimize the variability between the cases and the controls so that if you find any difference uh, like here the differences that we're going to find are mostly on the genetics so uh, what you find is that for cases you see that there are more red variants than in controls so if you find that statistically speaking uh, the population of cases have significantly more number of red variants than the controls then you can say that there is an association between that particular red variant and having the melanoma disease that's how it works uh, and and so genome-wide association studies are one of the greatest tools that we have now for for really understanding the contribution of uh, genetic susceptibility for the main uh, diseases that people die of so there's also something called the polygenic score catalog that builds on the genome-wide association studies and basically not every SNP not every SNP um, is going to contribute the same for you to have the, the disease so um, when you look at the different variants that you may find that have been associated to the disease some SNPs are going to be more are going to have more weight than others in developing the, the disease and we can we can have those weights for all of the SNPs that we have for the, the the disease that have been associated to the disease and then if you if you sum all of those weights you're going to end up with individuals that have a score of all the weights so if you sum all of the weights contributing um, you know some some people have more more SNPs that are pathogenic some people have fewer SNPs that are pathogenic so you end up by adding weights and then summing the weights that you find in a particular population you end up with with individuals risk and if you have an individual that matches all of the pathogenic SNPs that you find for let's say melanoma then uh, you're going to have a high weight 
and, and the ones that are extreme, extreme high weight in, by the summing of the risk that you get from the genome-wide association studies, then you can prioritize patients that are more, more likely to have uh, risk, high risk. Shall I say that again? Shall I explain it again? Uh, it's a black people uh, and then are they protected from the skin cancer? Or Sorry? Uh, people with melanin, are they protected by, are they protected from skin cancer? Or yeah, from I mean, obviously, uh, it depends on the exposure that you have to like ultraviolet. So if you have more exposure to ultraviolet light, uh, so you have a, an European, someone like me, and uh, someone from Africa who is different skin color. We are exposed the same amount of ultraviolet uh, intensity. I'm gonna get melanoma much faster than the than the other person. Okay. So he, he has a chance, but less chance. Of exactly. It's all probabilistics. So um, I'm just going to show you for Alzheimer's disease how this works. So um, you can see I have a list of SNPs here. Yeah, so those are the SNPs that I got from the Genome Wide Association study. So I have, um, I don't know how many there are, Let, let's say 20 SNPs. And those SNPs, we've identified that they're associated to Alzheimer's disease through genome-wide association studies. So the, the p-values, so the likelihood, the, uh, the likelihood that those, um, those, are, those SNPs are associated with um, that disease, is, is significant and so you end up with this list and you can actually add statistically speaking we can add a weight so you can see that these two SNPs RS7412 and the other one you know um, they have what we call a, an odds ratio so odds ratio means odds ratio of one means that it neither increases nor decreases the risk of developing the disease. If you have more than one, then it means, you know, in this case, if you have these two SNPs, you have 2.53 times average risk of developing the disease. So if, if you then sum up all of that, uh, you see actually that there are some SNPs that have less than one odds ratio, meaning they are protective. So it's all mathematical here, but what I want you to get in your mind is that when you test every single SNP in the patient and then sum all of the weights, you are going to have, you're going to be somewhere in this distribution of risk. Can you follow that? Mm -hmm. So depending on the amount of pathogenic, what we call uh, risk alleles, you're going to be somewhere in here in the distribution of risk. So the ones that are in the middle, so this is average risk or low risk. And, and it all comes from just measuring the, whether that, that SNP is present in the patient or not. And then summing all of the weights of all of the present SNPs that you have in the patient. And this is how we then use human genome to stratify high-risk individuals. And so if you are in the high-risk end of the distribution of, of risk, then you probably end up having three to five times average risk for developing the disease. Of course, it's just probability. You are not necessarily going to develop it, but if, if you are on the high risk end, then there are higher chances, okay? But again, uh, the fact that you're in the top 95th percentile of risk doesn't mean that you're going to 100% going to develop it. But at least now we then have ways in which we can begin to 
diagnose high-risk individuals and potentially um, perform preventative measures. So obviously, if you have a high melanoma risk, then you, you mustn't go to the beach, right? Because you you're have a high likelihood of, of having melanoma. So, and, and by, by, by having that little piece of information, then obviously you're going to have a much more um, uh, healthy, long, longer life, right? And that's, that's how it works, because this, this data already exists since the time of conception. So even before the symptoms arise, you now can use this information to help uh, see whether you're, you're a high-risk individual for some diseases or not. Of course, uh, this is not uh, you know, a, a crystal ball that is going to tell you the future. It's simply one independent piece of, inf of data, of information that didn't exist before that now you can use, for instance, uh, in conjunction with the traditional markers, you know, your clinical history, you know, let's say your um, vital constants, whatever. So, so, so this is a new piece of information that we didn't have, I, I would dare say, even five years ago, and now we can have it. And so this is the basis for uh, preventative medicine of the future. So medicine with and without genomics. So with genomics, now we have evidence that is molecular. Uh, we can stratify high-risk individuals, and we can treat and predict before the symptoms arise. Whereas if you don't have that information, then, well, it's just trial and error. You know, you have those uh, blockbuster um, uh, medicines that they give to everyone. For some people, it works. For some people, they give them adverse drug reactions. For most people, don't do anything. And so it's, it's kind of trial and error. Um, and so I'm just giving you one example. So here you have the most prescribed four drugs in the US, and uh, which are Abilify, um, uh, Nexium, and so on. So you see the proportion of people who actually have positive effects are highlighted as the blue um, uh, the, 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 the blue figure here. So you see that the vast majority of people, they either don't get uh, positive effects, no effects at all, or negative, right? And so these are the most prescribed drugs in the US. Um, I think homeopathy is the third one, which was purchased by Acfi. Obviously, it's for um, it's, I think it's for Crohn's disease and for art, right. arteriosclerosis. I think it had recently a trial that they're going to stop using it. That they're, it definitely like wasn't working. It was very harmful. Yeah. So, so this is coming from a an article that came out, I think, in Nature at some point, but it's, it's, simply a, it's simply an example just to tell you that genomics can help have better targeted um, prescriptions, okay? Um, you may have heard of uh, Angelina effect. So you know Angelina Jolie, right? Yeah, she had a double mastectomy. She also had, she removed her ovaries again as well, because uh, she knew that uh, her mother had and her grandmother had a breast cancer. Uh, she passed away. Uh, she found that she had the same mutation as her grandmother, and and then she, she just basically had that uh, in order to prevent disease. And so she has not had, obviously, that was mastectomy. She, she, she didn't have breast cancer in the end. Of course, this, this is a, an extreme example, but I think it was the first time where, you know, this really hit, hit home. You know, this, you have this uh, very famous person who actually, based on, on her genetics, she's made a massive um, intervention based on, based on those to, to, to prevent disease. And so this is now a reality. Um, and the way 
genomics has evolved. I said that the first human genome was released in 2001. Now, and it's a little bit obsolete. You know, we have hundreds of thousands of, of genomes that have been generated. And, and the more data that we have, the better we can understand how the variants affect disease. We're still quite far away, but um, the, the process of generation of this data has been incredibly uh, exponential. Um, so to the point that it's kind of become a, a sort of national um, priority for many governments, the first country that really started sequencing the, the population was Iceland, because um, for some reason they have kept their phylogenetic uh, re records, you know, their, their gene genealogic genealogy records since you know the first colonizers that went there like 400 years ago. So they know exactly who was there and what they died for. And because they now have the descendants, they can trace back um, the, the, the DNA mutations from the current population back into the generations and see when, when, when they, they came, when they were introduced. So this was an incredible um, project. That, uh, Sorry, how did they kept it? Because if they're, because I feel like the time, they didn't have the technology we have now, so how did they... Keep no, like death records, so this person died this year for this illness. Mm -hmm. And this person comes from, they have these children and that they had that other child. Tom, you can go now, I'll wait for you. So you can have, so they, they have the, the, the records of, of you know, the, what, what people die of, when they die of, it's just the records, they don't, they don't have genetics or anything, but now they have the genetics, but they know the, the people living today, they know who their ancestors were and when, when they lived and what they died for. So they can trace back, they can triangulate um, those diseases back to when they they, they arose, based on on their genealogic trees. So then, in 2008, you have UK 10K, which it was revolutionary. You know, um, they they released the first 10,000 genomes, um, and then uh, in 2013. Um, David Cameron decided to put 300 million pounds into uh, make what today has become Genomics England, which um, they uh, basically were, the UK was the first um, country to have 100,000 genomes. Um, and, you know, after that, the, the, the US uh, followed suit and then some others, but uh, in genomics, probably the UK is the most advanced in, in the whole world. Um, then by 2016, the chief medical officer, uh, she released something called the Generation Genome Report, uh, where they then committed 250 million up to 2021. Uh, and then in uh, 2022, now we have Genome UK, uh, where they're again putting more money. Uh, and basically, uh, now mm, the UK is going to seek, it's in the process, this is a little bit obsolete now, but uh, they're sequencing 100,000 newborns. Um, and then um, we have the UK Power Bank. They released uh, last year 500,000. Uh, whole genomes, but it's not just the the, gen the genomics. It also, the, the they have the clinical histories. They have you know uh, the, uh, the the anatomy measurements. So this this has revolutionized uh, our, our understanding of biology. Um, 
and, and I'm actually working myself with, with this data set. Uh, and it's, it's incredible. Um, there's nothing like this anywhere, anywhere else. And if, if that wasn't enough, now we have our future health um, where they are going to sequence 5 million people from the whole of the UK. And they're going to have their um, NHS records and all, all combined to develop uh, the, the, the most complete um, data resource ever to have been produced, leveraged for research and for science, right? Because, you know, you may have some other companies in the U.S. may have, you know, even even 23andMe, right? Not sure if you heard of 23andMe, there's this sort of direct-to-consumer genetic testing. Well, they have 10 million, but they only have their genotypes and they don't make it public. Whereas here, you have the appropriate um, mechanisms to be able to share the data safely within research communities to help advance our understanding of disease. And so, um, I mean, the Americans just come here. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard of this guy called Peter Seal. Uh, so you, you know PayPal, right? Yeah. So, uh, one of, and so he was co-founder with Elon Musk. And now he's got a very uh, supposedly murky, uh, uh, rather um, occluse, we could say, company called um, Palantir, you might have heard. So they do, uh, they just work mostly for the US defense and for the CIA, whatever. And they've now bought, the, 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 or they want to buy or they have bought NHS data to to mine it, use uh, artificial intelligence, and so on. Is it like legal? Um, well, if you make it, um, if you have the appropriate processes to make it anonymized, and you just have, um, it is possible for you not to know who who the actual individuals are, and then you can use that that data to mine and and and, and apply artificial intelligence to to. All the money just goes back to the NHS. Well, I mean, I don't know exactly how the, 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 the formula uh, or whether it's happened yet, but it's, but, you know, the fact that the Americans are coming here because they want to buy that, they don't have that because they don't have a, a centralized health system like we have here. And so um, that's a tremendous, so data, right? We are in, the data is the oil of the 21st century. So, so, so the UK somehow seems to have that age that, uh, you know, no other country seems to have right now. So um, it's, it's an incredible place to do the genomics and, and, and health data. Um, so here, I'm, this is a lot of words, but, you know, um, over 175 million to, to carry on, you know, like, um, and any other country is just playing catch up with the UK, you know, so they, whatever the UK does Which, suddenly yeah. becomes the poster child for, for other, you know, France is copying, you know, uh, uh, China is copying, everyone else is copying. And, and, you know, that is an incredible privilege for, for all of us. So here you have the future health letter that they told, that they sent me to become a participant. You may have received that letter. So I'm a, I'm a participant here. Okay, Paulina, you have a question? You want to put it on the, on the chat maybe because I can't hear you. But anyway, um, let's so I've given you perhaps more than you expected. Uh, uh, but hopefully, I mean, I'm, I basically condensed my uh, I wouldn't say all of my experience, but I certainly have put here that you have around 10, 10 years of my personal experience working on, on that I've tried to put it in a way that is digestible um, for, for you. But um, just, just, to, you know, just uh, to finalize, just talking about the future. So, uh, well, you all know that we are getting older, and especially, you know, uh, by 2060, uh, we're going to have in Europe 
Um, so, so basically, the, the number of, of people uh, that are in sort of working lives, they're going to go down uh, from to 275, whereas the, the number of people uh, older than 60, 64 years old is going to go like 60 million. So it's incredibly expensive. Uh, because you know, the older you get, the more the more need for for health health services that you have, and this is a tremendous uh, and less alone. And this is before COVID, right? And now that COVID is sort of makes things even worse. Whereas the here you have the um, expenditure of the total amount of the economy. The top line is the US, which is around 20%, and then uh, the UK is around. Uh, 15 percent is 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 being flat basically. So there's no more money going into that. Whereas the pressure is mounting because more people are getting old, they need more services. People have higher standards, things get more expensive. So we have a little problem here. So hopefully the idea is that by using uh, all this new genomic data together with artificial intelligence and so on, that we can get much better at diminishing all those uh, bad treatments that people get, for instance, with, with all those drugs that don't, don't have any use or they have no effect, and also having much more targeted um, diagnostics and treatments whereby you can get, you know, if, if you are able to predict disease and prevent disease, um, that's going to have much less cost than then having to have the operation, all the drugs, and, and etc. So that's that's the that's the vision and the hope for the future. And so the fact that with all of these data clouds that we're going to have, you know, biology becomes the center of, of of medicine, where you know sequencing is going to be routine, uh, not just DNA, but sequencing RNA, sequ uh, you know, um, doing metabolome, uh, all of the omics. Um, data sets which have contributions in the understanding of, of our physiology. And I believe that genomics certainly is a, you know, a tip of the iceberg, but it's certainly um, indispensable for the, for the medicine of the future. At least that's what I believe, and I basically bet my whole, my whole career to that. Um, then but with caveats, right? So genetics is not everything. It's determinant, but it's not, a, as I said, a, a crystal ball. Our knowledge is growing, and and so the 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 challenge is not the production of the data. The challenge is what to do with that data, and how to how to interpret it in in a way that help us have useful interventions that can be applied to individuals, and and that is unfortunately. Um, quite frustrating if you are trying to do genome sequencing in a preventative uh, environment because most of the time, if you stop, you know, uh, smoking, uh, getting drunk, and you know, you you, you have, uh, you know, you don't you are not obese, and then you do exercise, you know, most of these chronic diseases you are probably going to reduce significantly. So, although we may find. Um, genetic susceptibilities to diseases, currently the interventions that we have are quite limiting. But this, this kind of uh, genetic medicine is going to be here to stay. We're going to become better and better and better. And then eventually, it will be routine for every person, you know, from, from birth. Anyway, so I'll leave it there. Thank you for bearing this long session. I hope that you... Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. You. You're welcome. Can I ask you, please? Thank you so much, by the way. It was very yes. interesting. So I was like mm -hmm. looking at uh, some of my internships, and I found this company on LinkedIn, and I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's, it's just a consulting company, mm -hmm. and they're on the yeah. so, Sorry, do you mind if I just oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. No, I guess I don't want this personal yeah, conversation to, to be recorded. Yeah, no, 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 one second. Uh, I just need to close. Okay. 
I think that this is the recording process. Uh, how do I stop the